Okay, so shall we go ahead and get started? Um, my name is Kristen Kornienko. I'm the coordinator of the collaboration that is the uh, Global Studio. And I'm uh, really excited as always today to um, work with everyone from the Advocates for Equitable Design Education from it's the University of yeah. Calgary. Um, and I'd like to start with a, a land acknowledgement and then I will pass it over to Melissa. I'm privileged to look out at a beautiful lake on lands formerly known as the Salish region of Turtle Island, today known as the interior of British Columbia within the political boundaries of Canada. I'd like to acknowledge that I am a fifth generation white settler now living and working as an uninvited guest on the lands of the Sequepmec Nation, and that I benefit from the intergenerational wealth of land ownership. I'm a squatter on these lands, and yet our current system does not criminalize that squatting. Maybe we can say Thank you. Sorry. Okay. I have some Maybe background. <laughs> going on series. are you able to just mute everyone um i'm a squatter on these lands and yet our current system does not criminalize me for the squatting the region was not negotiated by treaty and remains to this day unseated immediately around where i stay this includes the people of the splatchine the Sconleth, and squilax bands Cooksjam, or thank you a Splatzine band council member described this equipment. Sorry, Kristen, you're muted. Was, was the entire land acknowledgement muted? No, just the last bit. Um, the, region was, the region was not negotiated by treaty and remains to this day unseated. Immediately around where I stay, this includes the people of the Splatchine, Nesconleth, and Squilax bands. Hooks gem, or thank you. A Splatchine Band Council member described the Sequetmec traditional lands to me as roughly defined by the Shushwap Lake watershed and occupied since time immemorial by the nation's diverse cultures. There's archeological evidence of their presence dating back over 15,000 years. I'd like to acknowledge and thank the ancestors and people of these bands for their ongoing inclusive activities towards healing and conciliation and in the defense of the land, water, and creatures of this region. And I commit to contribute to this in my roles as designer, educator, and activist. I also live and work in Egoli or Johannesburg, South Africa, on Veld that was the traditional lands of the San and Soto Tuana peoples. I learned in the course of my research that significant gold deposits were discovered in both Johannesburg and here within four years of each other in the mid 1850s triggering colonial mechanisms of land appropriation, displacement of communities thousands of years old, cultural assimilation and resource extraction from the land that continues to this day. I'd also like to acknowledge that in both the regions known as Canada and the US, colonists brought and bought and sold and enslaved African people to drive this economy. I'd like to hold this space for just a moment to think about and honor the reality of what this land acknowledgement means and challenges us to act on. And now I will pass the meeting over to you, Melissa. Great, thank you so much for that land acknowledgement, Kristen. What a great way to start this off. 
Um, I'm actually going to hand it over to my colleague, Sasha, um, and she will start us off. Hey guys. Okay, so uh, hello everyone. Uh, firstly, we'd like to remind everyone that we are recording this conversation. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedules to listen today and hopefully engage in the panel. Uh, as I know, as busy as we all are, it is important to take time to have these important conversations and reflect on where we are in our design journey. Uh, so that being said, welcome to the future or non-future of architecture panel. Uh, so as ADE is an organization based in Calgary, Alberta, we would like to do a, like a, a much smaller, uh, a small land, land acknowledgement. So uh, we would like to start by acknowledging the traditional oral practices and unceded lands of Treaty 7 territory, including the Blackfoot Confederacy, including the Siksika, the Gainai, and the Pikani, as well as the Stony Nakoda and Sutina nations. This land is also home to the Métis Nation uh, of Region 3. We are thankful as uninvited guests to be able to live, work, and learn on this land. So the agenda for today is pretty simple. Uh, so it includes some brief introductions, the panel discussion, which will take up the most um, biggest chunk of today, and any concluding thoughts. And uh, just a little bit of a primer on advocates for uh, equitable design education. Uh, we are a student collective from the University of Calgary School of Architecture, Planning and Landscape. Uh, AEDE is dedicated to the advancement of critical pedagogy in design and recovery of dialogues that are usually minimized in current design practices. And I'm going to hand it off to Abira. Thanks, Sasha. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming. I'm really excited to introduce our wonderful panel panelists that have taken the time out to join us today. Um, we are very lucky to have these four seasoned individuals whose approach to the design field questions the status quo and what we are typically taught in design education. Uh, we will ask each panelist to tell us a little bit about themselves and their practice. So, sorry, there's <laughs> my bird's not very happy, but. Um, First, we have Dr. Arjit Sen, who many of us at the University of Calgary's School of Architecture, Planning and Landscape have had the pleasure of learning from during Block Week. Um, Arjit, if you could please tell us a little bit about yourself. I first thank you so much for organizing this. It's always just wonderful to see students organizing transformative change because you know all of us, that's what we dream of. Um, and so thank you. Uh, my name is Arijit. I teach in the Architecture and Urban Studies programs at um, University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. I'm frankly an architect without a center. I, I'm a person who doesn't know where home is because I lived in six cities, five different states in India. And then when I came to the US, I lived in four different cities. I was always an outsider. But now I'm an American citizen, my diasporic and racial otherness actually helps me understand what it means to belong in multiple culture. And this kind of um, being in the cracks essentially helps me question some of the very basic meanings and representations I was taught in school. So I, I basically figured that our methods are problematic. So that's what I do. I teach in a um, place, a, a program called Buildings, Landscapes, Cultures Field School. We basically work with um, two communities in Milwaukee over a long period of time. And um, you know all our studios and projects are uh, attached to it. But I do have to say that I'm also sitting on uh, Ho-Chunk, Pot Potawatomi, and Menominee land. But I also, I also sit on a land, on a city where black and brown people have been racially segregated and exploited for years. But I also know from my practice that they still exist. They refuse to be defeated. And what I learned from that is their presence tells the story of this human spirit to survive and to fight against justice. I'm really glad to be here. Thank you again. Awesome. Thank you, Arjit. That's, this is why we're so excited to have you guys here. <laughs> um, yeah, very happy to have you joining us. Next, we have Maya Bird Murphy, who is the founder of Chicago Mobile Makers, which is an award-winning nonprofit organization. 
Um, Maya, please share a bit about yourself. Yeah, <clears throat> so thank you so much for having me today. Um, I am in Chicago and I have a, a background in architecture and I feel that I've kind of gone through this wavy journey through the field so far. Um, I decided to go to architecture school and very quickly realized that it was not a place that was made for me. And I started to work and realized that it was going to be very similar once I started in the profession. Mm -hmm. And then I knew that I had to figure out kind of a, a way out for myself and not necessarily out of the architecture field, but um, I knew that I wanted to gain some control and, and meaning in my daily practice. And so that's where um, Chicago Mobile Makers comes in. Um, that's a nonprofit that I founded in 2017. And we go all around the Chicago area um, to do design and problem solving workshops with young people um, that all have to do with healthy communities and making this world a better place through design. Um, I also now work at the School of uh, the Art Institute of Chicago and at Boston Architectural College. Thank you. Thank you, Maya. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Uh, next, we have Reza Nick, who is the founder of the experimental and multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary architecture firm Sheep and the founder of the Toronto chapter of the Architecture Lobby. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, Reza, please tell us a bit about yourself. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Um, yeah, I'm I'm based in Toronto right now, um, and Toronto, Canada. And I had kind of a similar path as uh, Maya, and it's really nice to meet you in person. I really admire what you've been doing with uh, with your practice and. Um, I, I kind of, I started in a, um, a art history background. Um, actually I started in commerce. I did that for one year and realized it's not for me and then went to, uh, art history. And then through that found my way to architecture. And, um, there was the social aspect or the social impact of architecture always is, it was something that I was interested in to think through, um, um, uh, issues that were happening at an urban scale. Um, but, uh, I, and I kind of jumped around. I, I've, uh, um, uh, much like uh, Dr. Arigit, I've, I've lived in many different cities. So uh, he said it beautifully of how he actually, it, it has influenced his, um, uh, his practice and his way of thinking. But um, it kind of like, it helped me uh, uh, think critically about uh, the profession itself. Because I finished my master's, um, I worked in like Argentina and Spain and, and uh, Austria. And then when I came back to Canada, I realized that um, uh, the way that it is practiced after graduating, working at a more of a corporate firm, because that was the only kind of job that was available. I realized that this is not what I like at all about architecture and um, I kind of went through that for a few years and then I left um, and uh, worked for Philip Beasley who's exploring the art world more uh, that's where I met Sasha as well and um, and I kind of that also wasn't completely satisfying for me because I felt like my head was in the clouds and um, I wasn't so grounded so there was something about the nature of being grounded within architecture and doing something that's impactful, like directly, which I missed. So then I eventually through, you know, various uh, chapters of my life, I, I eventually found that Sheep, which is um, kind of um, at the moment, the tagline is that we work at the intersection of community culture and architecture. So architecture kind of like comes at the end um, and we have sort of a list of values that we follow. Um, we listen first, we design later, we really think critically about the foundations of things. Uh, even the way that the practice is run, um, I'm thinking about um, either it's gonna be a not-for-profit or a cooperative, uh, how it's structured, uh, where we get money from, where how is it funded. 
so all these things are uh, constant, constant question. So uh, and been quite selective with the kinds of projects uh, that I've been taking it on. So thankfully, this is officially its second year. Uh, the anniversary is in a month. Um, it's still going. It's still surviving somehow. Um, and with whatever time I, uh, and I also teach at, at Daniels University of Toronto, so that the pedagogical thinking and questioning of even architectural pedagogy is super important, because I think that's at the root of a lot of our issues in the profession. Um, um, so that's a portion of my time and whatever I have left over, which isn't much, uh, is uh, sort of dedicated to the advocacy, which I co-founded the the Toronto chapter of the architecture lobby. So we're kind of advocating for more critical discourse and labor rights in architecture. <clears throat> and yeah, I'm really excited to have this conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Reza, for joining our discussion today. Uh, and last but not least, we have Dr. Sachaba Mape, who is the founder of Africtecture. And many of us at AED and Global Studio have had the pleasure of engaging with multiple times through Global Studio. Uh, so Java, please tell us about yourself. Uh, hi, everyone. Yeah, I kind of feel like um, I'm becoming part of the furniture um, uh, of the Global Studios. Um, but it is still a, a privilege and a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you so much for including me. Um, yeah, so I'm Sichaba. I'm a South African. Um, <clears throat> And uh, a lot of uh, the stuff that I've been doing has been connected to, uh, you know, just um, my interests in um, my master's year. Uh, I was uh, very interested in um, the history of my people here in South Africa and the origins of my people in South Africa. As everyone knows, South Africa went through apartheid and colonialism. And uh, one of the big things that happened in South Africa was that there was a lot of erasure, uh, political erasure of um, people's histories and identities. Um, and that kind of led me to doing a lot of work um, connected to archeology, span um, <clears throat> trying to search uh, really for who um, I am and who my people are in South Africa. Um, and um, I ended up doing a doctorate in um, architecture and uh, co-supervised in archeology. span uh, looking at the deep history and the origins of the people in my region, which uh, goes back many hundreds of thousands of years. Uh, I actually just came from a, 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 an amazing uh, field trip with my students today uh, at a place called the Cradle of Humankind in uh, near Johannesburg, where we visited some really old ancient um, uh, uh, caves where hominid species and that sort of thing um, uh, were found. <clears throat> and uh, uh, yeah, so a lot of my work really is around trying to um, use architecture to uh, deal with issues of trying to find out, um, you know, uh, what, what does it mean to be a human being when your humanity was kind of taken away from you. Um, as all of you know, uh, one of the largest things that uh, was done through colonialism was taking people's humanity away um, or denying them a kind of humanity. Um, and so, yeah, and uh, so now that also led me to doing a lot of uh, work in indigenous knowledge systems um, because, uh, you know, besides looking at uh, archeology span for answers um, in terms of who we are here in South Africa, uh, I also looked at indigenous knowledge systems uh, to kind of guide that question. Um, <clears throat> and so through that, my practice has really been about doing architecture in contexts uh, which are connected to um, tribal lands, so-called tribal lands, uh, using indigenous knowledge systems and architecture to uh, mediate between people, uh, landscapes, um, and culture. Um, I also teach at the Witt School of Architecture and Planning, um, one of the best architecture schools in South Africa. Uh, and um, I teach first year design. Uh, and my design studio is 
probably the only one in the country that is fundamentally uh, has indigenous knowledge systems from South Africa from um, <clears throat> basically black indigenous knowledge um, infused into the curriculum. And uh, the aim really there is to hopefully have students better capacitated to responding to the kind of briefs that clients will have because more and more of our clients are black people who want specific kinds of architecture based on their um, you know um, uh, world views uh, and so the old curriculum doesn't really cater for that um, and the kind of curriculum that we're developing is catering to respond to that kind of clientele more and more um, <clears throat> I also practice and um, my clients are the last client uh, I've been working with um, is, uh, she's a traditional healer in South Africa and she uh, wanted a traditional medicine um, facility. And uh, yeah, that, that we don't have any precedents in South Africa for that. And it required a lot of um, uh, coming up with new things because uh, the schools, uh, the discourse doesn't teach any of that. Uh, so yeah, that's pretty much what I've been up to. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you, Shaba. We're very grateful to have you be a part of this conversation today. Um, so thank you again to all of our panelists for being here. We want to jump right into the discussion, but just a reminder about the topic of the event. So in a society that actively accepts rapid climate change, a widening wealth gap and homelessness, the rate of change as we know it was and is no longer an acceptable speed. We must seek ways in which to subvert and revolutionize architecture from within in order to realize the, change, the kind of change that we seek. In understanding the crisis we are in, one must be critical and start with the aspects we don't typically acknowledge. If we continue operating in the current system where one attempts to fix and solve problems, we are only reinforcing societal issues rather than making an impact. Um, so I'm going to pass it on to Melissa, who's going to start to introduce our prompts. Great. Yes. Thank you to all the panelists. Those are great intro introductions and lead really well into the discussion portion. Um, so for the discussion, uh, just for the audience as well, we want it to be uh, quite fluid and open. Um, you can write in the chat box. We will have a mural link out too if you want to put your thoughts and comments um, on the mural board. Um, as well, you are welcome to unmute yourself at any time. Um, the prompts are kind of well-rounded questions that I feel like anyone can kind of engage with, uh, hopefully. So with that being said, um, give us one second as I put our panelists literally on a panel and you will all see what I mean. So give me one second. Mm -hmm. One more second, sorry, a lot of names to search through here. Okay. Okay, so everyone should be able to see our panelists on an actual panel. We just found out this tool in Zoom last night and we were loving it. So I hope everyone else does and is comfortable with it. Um, so I guess the first question uh, we want to get started with, and I think a lot of you already acknowledged this in your introduction, but maybe a little more detail. Um, we want to ask how are you as designers and educators subverting outdated profit-driven modes of practice? Um, for example, Reza, your practice sheep is experimental and in your words, thinks about architecture beyond buildings. Um, not to put you on the spot, but maybe you can elaborate on this uh, to start us off or anybody else, but. <laughs> sure. Um, I think, a big way that I've been trying to think about it is um, 
to think about like architectural skills and uh, what things are architecture like so the the skills that we gain in architectural education i think are are quite remarkable and the way i think about it is um, um, the tools that we gain are to kind of make sense of complex systems and break them down into simpler terms and you can apply that to anything kind of um, and obviously aside from the technical tools um, we can look at things that are quite complex and begin to break them down in more digestible forms and um, for me and for sheep it's kind of been um, really disrupting some of the uh, processes that we learn in school um, that are um, I would say based on the settler colonial way of doing architecture that you kind of like look at land as as a thing that you just need to split and divide and conquer and maximize and kind of like abstract the things that are important to that land for the sake of architectural arguments and whether it's about like being a formalist and like you know just really going at it because the form is amazing or something that's parametric or something that uh really doesn't actually consider the the humans and the context that are there that were there um and those are the things that i really try to with all of our projects put at the forefront and even within the the courses that i teach i i try to really highlight the fact that uh we've conveniently abstracted so many things for the sake of architectural design and we can't do that anymore and we shouldn't do that and that's not um a good way of designing i don't care how good of a designer you are uh if the context and the the people the community the the culture wasn't really considered then it it doesn't really uh vibe well with me so um it's it's been about a lot of it has been to kind of like intentionally put ourselves in uncomfortable um uh, situations or uncomfortable processes because uh, it's really easy to jump to the the things that we know because it is a complex thing that we deal with um, and it's very easy to sort of begin to look at um, the the land or whatever even if it's a small scale project to look at it from a uh, planner's view from you know from above um, but so we really try to like think about zooming in, really thinking about the the nitty gritty of where it's going to exist and how how it's going to be used. Um, and as I mentioned, it's like one of the things is like we we consciously and I implement this in my courses as well um, is to not jump to design, to actually absorb for a good chunk of the semester. And then you slowly begin to design because I think pedagogically we're trained to sort of reward and um, um, think about architecture. It's like, you know, who can jump and you got to iterate and you got to sort of like jump to conclusions or like design something that's amazing right away. But you actually forget about what the what the intention is and what the research behind it is. So, yeah, that's that's some ways hopefully it uh, opens up. Yeah, discussion. that's great. And as a student, I can totally relate to that. Uh, like in a studio, you have such a limited amount of time and you have all these big ideas at the beginning and they slowly get watered down for the sake of form and for iteration. And you, you're you left with a project that you're it's not doing what you wanted it to. And yeah, I definitely think that's the problematic thing. Um, and yeah, I also really like I think we also saw on your website the the quote, get comfortable with discomfort. And I think that's so important as students to know, like if you are always engaging in projects and um, the world of academia in a way that's you're really comfortable, then I don't think we are kind of challenging the system enough. Um, yeah, uh, is there anything else uh, any of the other panelists want to add about how their kind of modes of practice do a similar thing? Well, I was just going to jump in and, and say that I feel like architecture, I sometimes call it like a shoot because you like enter in when you're in school 
and then there, it, you're just going so fast and there's no time to like to stop and think about what you're actually doing and you're just like shooting through this entire thing and then you're suddenly like a licensed architect working at a traditional firm and it feels like there's there's just no time to actually think about what your values are um, what you're actually trying to do on a day-to-day -day because you've been told that there's this very specific way to practice. And so you just keep doing things that people have told you to do because you believe that that's what's the right thing. And I think a lot of people will do that path and will go on that shoot and they'll be completely fine and, and happy. Um, but I think there just needs, there need to be more times where like, like a couple of you said to just to talk to people or to sit down and analyze or research. Um, and I think we, we, we do get really comfortable and just, we're just in the shoot trying to get things done as quickly as possible. Yeah, I a thousand percent agree. And just looking at um, some of the comments on Mira board, Cindy's writing about just focusing less on chasing the final product and placing more value on the process you get there, exploring how this process can take an unconventional path so we can learn more about those and around us. So maybe I know this is like, it's gonna be hard to think of this right off the bat, but in any of your experiences kind of in the process work, have you arrived at something unconventional or that you didn't think of because you took so long in the process and it ended up actually benefiting the, pro uh, the project a lot more um, than you could ever imagine? I know it's kind of putting you on the spot, but. I think that's interesting. Uh, I could comment on that. Um, I think, uh, well, at least for me, um, the process is just ongoing all the time, every day, every moment. Uh, it just never stops. So when there's an opportunity to produce something or to do something, it kind of, uh just sort of latches onto an existing process you know because uh i don't I, like i said in my in my work i don't have the benefit of precedence you know like for example <clears throat> one of the projects i give my students to do is to design an initiation center uh, a place where um, young young men or young women go for initiation um and you know there's uh there, there aren't any real precedents uh you know for example uh the kind of things that are required from there um uh you know uh, some of the other lecturers don't even know what is required because it's just not part of their culture you know south africa is like uh dominated by uh white western um pedagogy and uh worldview especially in mainstream architecture um but it's so as soon as you introduce something that is embedded within the local worldview or local culture a lot of the colleagues don't really get it so we kind of have to invent stuff as we go along and uh to mitigate uh getting to a situation where you have to you you know you're presented with a brief and you have to kind of figure it all out in the you know in the uh, process of the actual project uh, what i do is i sit in my studio every single day uh just thinking about every single scenario you know i give myself problems the whole time like for instance um you know if if uh, a certain kind of cultural protocol is presented to me as an architect what do i do you know like uh, often people will say stuff like, um, you know, this land is sacred. I mean, when somebody says this land is sacred, I, I, I don't know, maybe you guys in Canada have like, you know, textbooks you can go to and you can quickly read. What do you do on a sacred piece of land? Unfortunately, we don't have stuff like that here. And so it's, uh, you know, for, it's, it's exciting as well because it means it's like a, an incredibly creative process. And as, a, as an indigenous person myself, I don't feel like I need to worry too much about cultural appropriation. 
So cultural appropriation is a very Western thing, you know, in, in the sense that in my context, people who usually talk about cultural appropriation are the ones who came, you know, through their colonial ancestry. I don't have to worry about that because it's my culture and I can adapt it, uh, you know, as long as it serves my people, I can adapt it as much as I want. Um, so <clears throat> I guess what I'm saying is that, you know, it means that there's just a lot of invention, a lot of creativity. Um, sometimes as an architect, I even create new customs, you know, they're, they're new, new things that weren't there before because we're dealing with a new context, modern situations, we have to invent new things. Um, and I think it's exciting, you know, uh, and uh, it means that there's a lot of research to do and a lot of imagining and, and creativity. I'm gonna, I'm gonna add to that. Um, that makes me think like a lot of us use precedence when we're doing our studio projects and stuff. And like, that's kind of what we're taught to do is like approach a project through other projects, right? So it's interesting to hear that you kind of don't even have that opportunity in your project. So I'm wondering like, how do you know then when you're working through the process, whether you're going on the right track or not? Like, how do you, how do you, how do you gauge that if you're doing it right, if you're doing it wrong, if there's nothing for you to compare it to? Um, I don't know if that's directed to me, but I'll just quickly say, like I said, it's a creative thing. Um, you know, like imagine the day that, uh, say, for example, um, a lot more African American people become liberated, both socially and economically. Like, let's just imagine the scenario like that. And suddenly, all of them want architects to design stuff for them. You know, uh, there'll probably be a lot of scenarios that are not catered for in the architectural education. So what are we gonna do? And that's actually a possibility. You know, just yesterday I was looking at something on the net and they were talking about, uh, and I mean, I know it's a contentious thing, but they were talking about black excellence. Um, and I was like, wow, you know, imagine they were like a whole lot of black clients suddenly. You know, do we have architects that even know how to respond to that? Um, would they really know what to do? So it's actually a real scenario. Same with like uh, the ecological thing. People are inventing stuff, you know, it's not like uh, it's all like laid out. We, we don't always know what to do. So again, I think it's a creative process. Yeah, I really like that. And it seems like there's just like a lot of talk around this subject of we're no longer imagining buildings we're kind of instead designing alternative realities. And I think all of you kind of do that through different mediums and processes that aren't so atypical. Like I think Arjit and the work I have done with you before too, you, you almost help communities design alternative realities in urban cultural landscapes through senses and empathetic listening. Um, so maybe you can touch on that because I think you, you're really, you're, you're allowing the communities to kind of create this reality for themselves and teaching them some skills around that. Yeah, I think um, when you talk about change and how change happens in architecture, um, it's a difficult one. It's a very difficult question because, you know, what I did, I look at, I, I'm gonna talk about myself and my background and why I do this. Um, as a diasporic person, as a person who moves all the time and feels never a part of that mainstream culture, whichever one it is, um, you begin to realize what architect, what you've been taught about architecture, permanence, form, uh, materiality, are only one side of the coin because architecture is actually both permanent and impermanent, tangible and you know intangible, kind of symbolic. So the what as a result of that recognition um, that I carry architecture with me. Wherever I go, I deploy that sense of memory of architecture and create space. I began to see how um, people in communities in Milwaukee or uh, you know, I, my, the other part of my research is um, immigrant communities, how they take over a space that is produced by someone else and then recreate that place, which of course, from an architectural point of view, it's not their space because they never built it. The physical structure is built by someone. So how do you recognize that? 
as a teacher um, in my case. And so the, the biggest answer, two answers actually, one is deep listening. You do not only have to listen to people, but you also have to look at the building because the building speaks to you about values and cultures that are embedded in it. So it's kind of like um, embodied energy, both in terms of like, you know, energy as in, as you hear in sustainability, but it's embodied memory inside buildings. So deep listening is that one. And the second one is time. We, I realized that um, even though we think of architecture as space and materials, architecture is actually temporal. And that temporality, um, our, our kind of, when we look at the uh, architecture, we see the physical form, we see things, our vision, vision centered analysis really takes away from the temporality, the long-term no notion. So what we do uh, in, um, in the field school, that is the, the stuff we do with the communities here, is one, number one, we unlearn. That's the most important thing. You know, you do five years of architecture and then you spend the entire life unlearning the whole thing. And that unlearning has to do by listening to the community because there are, these are people who have lived in the world that we design. They know what the problems are and they know how they are resolved. So that deep listening takes a long period of time. It can't be done in one semester and one studio. So, so essentially that's one of the drawbacks of trying to teach architecture in a semester in a studio. Um, the second thing that we have to do is um, literally not focus on property and objects that people own. So think not of authorship who designed this. So for me, um, it's not so important for a, for a fa fancy architect to do something sim you know, awesome. It is the commonness that allows people to share and care about their space that makes architecture what it is. So that really ends up in my studio as an aesthetic practice. I think our aesthetics is complicit in the in inequalities and injustice that you see here all around us. So how do we actually get away again in that? the community members become our teachers. Again, that whole notion of not knowing becomes central to how you, we should practice architecture. So that's what we do. I don't know if I answered your question, but. Yeah, no, that, that's great. And that kind of someone in the mural board, I'm sorry, I didn't see, see who wrote this, but goes with that. It's that we as designers are meant to be the initial facilitators of the process. And then we let it advance beyond our control. Um, and I think that's really key is that the facilitators point. Um, I don't know if anyone else has anything they wanted to add to that. Yeah, I can just jump in maybe like, cause I think <clears throat> the importance of um, facilitating in, cause one of the things I've been really interested in and is, is to actually have both the teaching and the practice to actually begin to put some of these ideas in action and to really encourage that within the studio uh, uh, environment of architecture school. Uh, so even the, the briefs of uh, the, the, the projects promoting to not just be speculative, but also like if you are dealing with a specific community um, to go out there, like actually go to community events uh, go to neighborhood land trust events and meet people, talk with them, interview them. Uh, don't take up their time like uselessly, but like really actually engage in conversations. Um, and this sort of idea of uh, facilitation in, in practice and in pedagogy is really important uh, in my opinion. And sort of like even like thinking about um, uh, different ways of teaching, like we speak about like almost every class that I teach teach, I at least dedicate a bit of time to speak about like Paulo Freire and like pedagogy of the oppressed. And it's like, you know, this is like, I give you agency, not just because I'm like lazy as a teacher and I don't want to do the work and I'm asking for your opinion to like engage in this course, but it's like, no, no, this is an actual way of learning. And, um, and the unlearning is like, I think the, uh, especially for some stages of, of schooling that's that's really difficult because yeah you dedicate so much time to learning these things and perfecting these ways and these processes and then you're kind of like asked 
in one studio to be like, you know what, begin to actually unlearn some of those things. It's like, hey, well, what's going on? I just like spent so much time, four years, like doing those things. Um, but I'm also like quite conscious of letting them know that it, it is like I'm consciously like I went back and forth and I finally got, got my license. I'm like, okay, I I'm consciously not going the uh, I really want to try it as a licensed architect to, to implement some of these in action, in actual projects. So it's not so speculative. And that hopefully it is in some way saying that, hey, it's if you do get your license, if you do go the path of practice, uh, you don't leave the stuff that you were interested in in school behind and just be like, all right, now I'm just going to be doing like door schedules for some condominiums. Uh, and I guess, you know, the interesting community work I was doing or like the more experimental work I was doing in school is done. Um, and that's the issue. And I've even heard educators talk like that about courses and be like, you know, this is your time to experiment because then when you're done school, that's done. And I think that's just like such a terrible way to promote like and encourage students to continue these thoughts. Um, and it leaves a lot of students questioning why the hell did I actually choose to study architecture then? Like, I should have just gone to like some technical school and learn how to use Revit and, and whatever software, and that would have probably gotten me the job and got, got me more money too. Um, so I don't know, there's like this idea of like facilitation. I think it also starts from a lot of educators that, um, are promoting that and then students come out and then they see the real world of the practice and they're like hell no I don't I don't want to do this or they stick with it and they just like are unhappy like 90 percent of architects that I meet at least in this context in Toronto are like I hate this I don't want to do this this is not why I study architecture even the ones that are like principals are like managing projects they're like why am I doing this this is not what I wanted to do and no one's like really saying much they're just like continuing and um that's at the core of it i think yeah it's the idea of like we have to be facilitators we have to not constantly reward and encourage this like you know you're the master builder you're this divine being you have the hand of god that you are the architect and just be like hey let's have conversations you will you will make some mistakes and you will do something things that are maybe good uh but let's actually question like what are the questions you're asking um and i think that's really important and i i, I try to do that in both practice and teaching um so it's not one or the other yeah i think that's so important and i think that's a lot of discussions um i'm having with people at school and within this group and we we hope that the pedagogy pedagogy will change and like speaking to individuals like you, um, it's it's inspiring, but unfortunately it's not our experience in education a lot of the times. And it's almost as students, we hearing these stories, we have to start during our education, imagining the realities we want for the field and doing it from within education, regardless of maybe what we're being taught at the time. Um, and with that, I think uh, Sasha or Joy, you had a question you wanted to ask. Um, I was just going to say a lot of what y'all have touched on is very, it resonates and there's almost this argument for consulting people over precedence in some capacity. And I think that's pretty valuable, but something that, uh, people initially or inevitably face as they transition from school to practice is being confronted with a lot of systems and bureaucracy. So I'm kind of curious how you can still get around this and keep some of that spirit of advocating for change and bring these experimentative practices and more inclusive practices to one's work in the profession. Like for example, Maya, a lot of your work uh, empowers youth and gives them this exposure to the potential change that could impact in their communities and using design as a tool for that, whether they explore a design career later or not, but like targeting this youth demographic too is a very important way of at least showing people early on that you can confront changes and these systems. And I wonder how you think we can translate that in a way that it's more 
um, to, in order to expatiate this kind of youth oriented approach. Like we can also look at it in terms of just regular citizens, not necessarily just youth, but youth as well. And how we can start to engage them in a way that they see that they also can curate and impact their communities and environments. I think there's a lot of pushback from the profession in some capacities that they feel threatened when more than just people with an architecture's license or design degrees start trying to change and impact spaces. So how do you think we can better get over that hump and address these people, maybe putting up these extra walls and barriers for expanding the field in that capacity because of this threatening feeling? Yeah, I do think that threatened is a good word for it. Um, and I think that we need to, this, this problem needs to be attacked from like all sides. And so I think that I'm addressing kind of one of those sides, which is, which is the youth or kind of the regular citizen, because obviously young people are gonna grow up and then they're gonna be the ones who are living in our communities and making, um, making decisions and, and everything. And so I think the reason that I thought that targeting young people was going to be um, really great for me was, I think one huge part of it was that this is kind of what I wanted to do for my career. So I always like make that really clear that like I decided to start this nonprofit because I knew that it was going to make me happy and it's the way that I wanted to practice architecture. Um, but there are so many ways, I think, to chip away at the problems that we see um, in the built environment um, altogether. And so I think that Mobile Makers was really about starting to give young people agency um, and ownership over their communities and show that they actually have the power to make change if they want to. And so to me, that was the like very grassroots version where we are not going to wait for architects to decide that communities that are disinvested are important. So we can't continue to wait. I mean, like Chicago communities now, <clears throat> some communities here look the exact same as they did 50 years ago. And there's no building happening. Um, there's no real effort um, until recently with something that's called Invest Southwest that's happening here in Chicago. Um, and so to me, this is about kind of, we're gonna sidestep the industry and we're going to make change in the built environment ourselves. And so I'm going to help hand out all of these different skills and tools that young people can use as they grow up um, to become people who care, um, responsible citizens, um, and people who may, might actually later have the power to, to you know, be, maybe they're policymakers or artists or lawmakers, whatever they end up doing, um, they will go in more equipped with kind of a, a toolkit um, to make change in their communities. But I think that's only one, like I feel like this is one small way um, to make this change. I do think that if we talked more about social and, and environmental issues in school and undergrad, um, it wouldn't be that crazy to then graduate and just continue doing that. If it was actually ingrained in the curriculum, we wouldn't have trouble talking to people. We wouldn't have trouble doing community engagement. And so I think that those are two ways educationally um, that I think things could, could make a lot of change in the future. You know, can I just um, add to something that Maya just said, which is so important. She said um, something about care. And I feel like architecture is not a profession of production. It's a profession of care. And if we use the ethics of care, the center of our profession, then we'll see uh, some really important things. First, we'll see that architecture is not about making new forms all the time. It's about not about newness. It's about repair. And as soon as you change from the ethics of like, you know, avant-garde production to an ethics of repair, you begin to realize it also becomes environmentally sustainable in many ways. Um, if you think of care, you know, you can, instead of looking at architecture as something that you own, it's an architecture that is shared, becomes the commons. 
So I think that way of thinking about architecture, which unfortunately we really don't do in school, most classes, would really transform us as human beings. That's the transformative potential of architecture education. And the last thing I wanted to say, it's also architecture is not just about, um, you know, the physical, I'm not saying that just go listen to people, okay? I do say that architecture, the physical form is important because it does tell how people value their lives, things that they don't bother to tell us, but it's there in the way they live, leave an imprint in the environment. That's also careful thinking. It's all about being very, very empathetic and caring. So I felt like that, Maya, what you just said was just so central to what we want to do. May, may I just um, put a bit of a span in the works? Um, you know, I, I wanted to um, just maybe raise the issue of um, getting paid and uh, actually uh, earning a salary. Um, uh, you know, all of the, the, the kind of work that I do, I mean, I, I've just got a, a, a message from a client who's asking me, when are we meeting? because I quoted her something of the equivalent of like 500 Canadian dollars to do something for her, right? Which is basically nothing because I'm just so passionate and in love with this community and I wanna do stuff for them. Um, but the reality is that I, you know, I have a family and I have to actually feed them. And uh, what Joy and, um, and, and Abira and myself had spoken about a while ago, um, when they were, you know, thinking about this particular program, uh, this particular conversation, was, uh, you know, how we can actually think about um, practice, reinvent practice in such a way that, you know, we can actually make a living out of uh, um, these new ways of doing doing architecture, um, or these alternative ways of doing architecture. And, you know, <clears throat> I tried to do something in my school where I tried to get uh, students to start thinking entrepreneur in, in an entrepreneurial way. Um, and not just because, you know, they, they, they're supposed to make big bucks and like, you know, have Silicon Valley startups or anything like that. But because uh, we're trying to, you know, make this whole thing um, sustainable and, um, actually trying to incentivize people. So I had my students, uh, I basically told them they need to start their own little practices right from first year. Um, and I forced them to go and register these, these uh, companies of theirs. Um, and, I, and I said to them, you know, think about everything, think about your brand identity, think about what your company is all about. Um, and start doing it now. You don't have to do things that require you to be licensed, you know, right now. You could start doing stuff that, um, you know, doesn't need you to be licensed and you're not going to be practicing illegally, but you're learning about what it means to actually, you know, um, do something that will give you some kind of revenue. Um, and I think that's maybe something that you guys probably want to think about and something you're interested in, I, I would imagine, you know, you, you don't want to be broke the whole time because you're not actually going to, you know, um, you're not going to make, you might make an impact uh, in, some, in some ways, but I think eventually you're going to have to like, you know, uh, I don't know, put food in your stomach. Um, so, so I, I just think maybe that's something we can think about as well, you know, um, because the reality of it is that, yeah, all of us, all of us need to have lodgings um, and, and we need to have food. So, so, so for me, uh, I, I survive by um, doing everything and anything that I can to make an extra buck, you know, I take, um, I, I, mean, I mean, anything and everything in the sense that um, you know, uh, whenever there's a small opportunity to make however many cents um, uh, in, in, in things that are meaningful, I try and, I try and look for those things. Um, and, and I try and take the payment seriously. 
um, even if it's like uh, you know the five hundred uh, the five hundred dollars I was just talking about. I try and take it seriously, um, uh, and and yeah, it does help. So you have to think about that, you know. So maybe the other panelists could could talk about what what that's like for them. And I also get a salary from my university. <laughs> Yeah, I can talk a little bit about that. Um, so I think there's something that we should be doing in school too, which is showing people how to run businesses. And I think, I think as Reza said before, architects or architecture students have so many skills that can be used for so many things. And so I felt really equipped starting a business um, after getting out of architecture school. Like I didn't do any business classes. Um, I just felt like I was in a marketing role for a little bit at an architecture firm, so that kind of helped as well. But um, I felt like I, I didn't know anything, but I felt like I could figure it out because I'm good at problem solving because of architecture school. Um, and so I'm to the point where you know, I founded the company in 2017. And this past summer um, in 2021, I am now a full-time employee of the company. And then I also have two full-time employees and a part-time employee. And so like there, there are ways that you can get paid and have a living um, doing alternative work. Um, there are a lot of people in Chicago, at least like a small, strong group of, of people doing non-traditional work. And I think everybody has to get creative, but um, it is, completely 100% possible to start your own practice and to then um, do it full time. And so it's going to be a lot of work. And it took me, you know, that long to be paid semi fairly, I'm still not getting paid a lot. Um, but I am, I am definitely in a stable place, and I don't worry about money anymore. Um, and so, yes, it, it can be done. It is a lot of work, but it can be done. And just touch on that too and I appreciate the raising that question because that is it's kind of taboo <laughs> to speak about a lot of times it seems it's like wait 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 no no you're in architecture because you're passionate like you got to give your heart and soul and blood and it's cool if you can just survive off like I don't know shawarmas and shawarmas actually like excelling that or like you just survive off like crackers and that's cool that you got to do that. It's the hustle. It's the hustle culture. You got to like, you know, you put the hours in and, you know, I'm, I'm in, this is like technically the third year I'm practicing on my own second year that she is practicing on its own since its existence. Um, I'm still like, I'm not making much money from sheep right now. I have one person who's uh, almost full time, like 30 hours a week. Um, and I like to pay above average. Uh, so, you know, a lot of that is salary. Um, thankfully, I don't have rental like overhead for space, which is great, or else it would be kind of impossible to have one person helping full time. Um, What's been helping is the teaching. Teaching, uh, I started about six years ago, slowly as a sessional or an adjunct, depending on wherever you are. Like, and now I have a part-time contracted position that you know it's decent, it comes with benefits. Um, there, there is certain percentage of uh, work that is, like the university helps pay for work-study students. So I put in like 30% of their salaries um so that it's kind of like it scrambling scrambling things to make things work um but you're right it's it's especially this year i one of my goals had been to you know i'm i do a lot of undervalued sometimes free work for different communities um and i've come to the realization one everything takes time if you want to do good good work and that time is generally money that we're losing on and um 
funny enough, like there's a lot of client work, but the ones that play that pay better, I'm not as interested in because it's like I'm not as passionate about. So it's kind of like beginning to mitigate between all these things. I'm like, okay, this this client paid money. Uh, for example, we have like two projects. Uh, one is almost done, but that are just like home renovations, which, you know, I don't want to really do that. But it's like, okay, this person, it was a friend of a friend. They pay some fees that we can help them. Um, and it's been one of the reasons, like the, the financial aspect of it, which is, it, I kind of have a, um, since I was in school, since I was young, like I've been working since I was like 16 at retail jobs, whatever, like I don't come from a wealthy family. So everything's been like, just like work, 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 trying to make money for school, for whatever, for outings and things. Um, and one of the things I've realized is the the projects that like, like I appreciate learning about how to run a business, learning about expenses, learning about like budgets and things, but then also like in line with that, not attaching everything to the value of, uh, in terms of monetary value. Cause then I, I see a lot of like if that was like the metric I was using, she would not like, we would not be doing many of the projects that like one of my favorite projects, which is going to be happening again this summer is to work with youth. And we are taking over a space in like the financial district of downtown Toronto. It's a gallery space. And we basically give them the space for free. They can create work. They can exhibit work. We have listening sessions, film screenings, like, all sorts of things that is just like actually like you know i kind of hate term bipoc but like it's like black indigenous brown folks that are occupying a space that was not made for them and it's like hey it's free and you can just like have this space do whatever you want and it was free for us too we put so much time into it we didn't get paid and this year we're trying to fundraise and be like okay you know what in order to do it sustainably we need to get some money because we're spending up so much hours um, and we don't want to get burnt out. So there's kind of a balance of like, if someone, if I was super, if I was thinking super entrepreneurially, I would not do those projects. I would not do a lot of, of those projects, but, um, I've been trying to sort of like balance. And that's why sheep has been, it's specifically saying that we don't really have a focus. Like a month ago, we took on a fabrication project for, a couple of artists actually from South Africa uh, who go by the name of Made You Look. Uh, we made this like 13 foot sculpture, which is made of cardboard and it's called Non Monuments. And it was built in like Union Station in Toronto. Uh, and that paid money. It was like, okay, are we fabricators now? Sure. If the right project comes along, we'll take it on, make a quick buck, <laughs> pay some bills. Or I do murals too, like murals, like the last time I, I, the last one I did was actually in Calgary. Uh, it was like, okay, yeah, I'll do that. And there's some others coming this, this summer that I'm going to take on. It's like, okay, murals, it's good. It's short term. It's not like architecture that takes like a year, um, but it is like a couple of weeks or a week, paint something, get money, put it into the practice. Um, so that's the aim right now to sort of like begin to divide a part of it is like a lot of people ask like why I like sheep does so many things it's like it's kind of survival too like I'm interested in many different things but it's also survival just like getting paid um, so it's I think it's important to think about um, how you can run a business but I think one aspect of it I would layer on to that is about how do we actually share resources to like, how do we cooperate uh, co-op? Like, how do we, what's the verb cooperativize? Like, how do we, like, if I'm doing this thing, learning how to do all the accounting and all that crap that, which I don't enjoy, how can we encourage and like, how can I use the resources to actually help other younger people to be like, yeah, straight out of school, you're going to start a business. And these are the resources that you can help with. And so it's not like we're not competing with each other as small practitioners, uh, but actually um, helping each other because there's 
plenty of work out there. No one needs to really compete. Uh, and we need to sort of this sense of competition in architecture, we need to sort of like dismantle in order to do some things that are more meaningful. So yeah, I scrape by right now and hopefully in a few years, I've, I've given myself five years that it's like in five years, it's the second year right now, by fifth year, thankfully things have been moving faster. So hopefully before then there will be more stability in terms of the finances, but it is something that, yeah, stresses me on a daily basis. Uh, and I'm kind of pretty honest about it on, on social media when I speak about it, because a lot of people don't don't consider that. So yeah, I, I really appreciate the topic. And oh, that that was great, and I think it's so important and helpful for students listening in, because I think in school and as we're about to exit school, we're we're kind of caught in this place. It's like we hear horror stories and we're like, do we sell out and work for a developer and be able to live? Or do we work endless hours at a small speculative firm and we don't get paid and we can barely get by, even, but we're doing good. So it's really nice to hear that we can have this balance. It doesn't mean it's not gonna take a lot of hard work, but it is possible. And that's kind of really what we wanted to do with this panel. As I know, a lot of the students here are graduating as well. so. I think this bit of inspiration is so, at least for me, it's so valuable. Um, I also just wanted to like highlight a few um, comments in the chat. Um, sorry if I don't pronounce your name right, uh, Dilruba, but uh, they mentioned how their salary at their first architecture job was less than the driver of their boss, which, wow, I'm so sorry about that. That is not right. Um, we have another question, um, Manya. The students that we teach often have deep rooted beliefs about our built environment and its users, which holds to colonized beliefs. What should be our approaches to inform the classroom with decolonized knowledge? This is so small on my screen, I can't read it. <laughs> but that's a great question. I don't know if anybody wants to address that. Just before someone answers it, just because we're also on the topic of compensation, I think uh, one approach would of course be to bring knowledge keepers or the community in who are versed in certain practices. But I think I'm curious how you balance the valuing people's time and how you can consider compensating these people that are coming out of their way to share their knowledge because if you're not able to compensate them in whatever form that may be, it seems like just mirroring that extractive process. So, yeah, I want to actually uh, respond to Joy because I think the whole notion of architecture has become extremely extractive. The notion of art, vocation, love, everything has become like something that we do free. And what we really need to understand that everything that we do is actually labor. And we really has, we have to put our foot down to realize even students working in a studio is labor. They're learning. Yes, I understand. Interns are learning, but it's also labor. And that every labor, I mean, this is the biggest problem I face when I work with my community members. I can't pay them money because the university doesn't consider their knowledge as relevant for payment. They are not experts that we are, I'm told, or they don't have any services to offer. And if we don't, we don't change that from our educational, from the place I work in, which is the university corporatized system. If we don't change that notion of what, what expert knowledge is and where labor, what labor gets paid for, we're not gonna go anywhere. So I feel like that uh, stuff that you brought up about the compensation is important, not just for architects, but for students, for community members, everybody who's putting in, pitching in their knowledge. Um, I don't have the answer having said that but i think that's a struggle that's the micro struggle that goes on in our own souls too when we tell ourselves that because we are architects we are doing this because we are you know we love the profession yes we do but we need to be paid sorry i just went off on a rant no, I, I second that like it is so important that all of you get paid for anything that you do 
And we're at the point where we're even going, you know, we're, we're budgeting and fundraising so that we can even pay kids who are doing programs as well. And so like, if someone is, is using their brain or, you know, even physically helping with labor, like everybody needs to be compensated. And it's so hard to ask. And that's something that I had to, to figure out pretty quickly is how to ask for money. Um, but it's, it's a, such an important skill to have and you should just start practicing now. <laughs> yeah, and it, I, I would just add like, for example, I will call them out on it, but few couple of months ago, like the interior design show in Toronto, they reached out saying that they're putting this panel together on equity, diversity, and inclusion, blah, blah, blah. Can you be on the panel? I was like, sure. What's like the, what's the compensation? And they're like, oh, unfortunately, uh, there's no budget, but there's a lot of eyes. There will be a lot of eyeballs on you. I was like, man, I got eyeballs on me. I don't need that. That shit doesn't pay my, my bills. So I'm like, you guys are like, like I do free talks for like high school students or something, but like an interior design show of Toronto where they have so much capital they're putting and they, they, and I, you know, some of my friends are on that panel and I'm thinking about my strategies of how to call them out and not get sued, but it is, um, it, it is where anonymity comes, comes, uh, comes in handy also um, of, um, thinking about labor on all fronts, I 100% agree and community members and um, universities don't seem to understand that. They don't seem to um, do that. And um, yeah, the summer wrote exposure. Exposure, it's like just free. And it seems to be, and a lot, a lot of people take it because, you know, it depends where you are in your career. Like also sometimes, yeah, you maybe you want, like you're getting asked to, be in a context that you were normally not and you would do it for free and um the people in power need to recognize that and like you know as long as there's the oppressor there will be the oppressed so thinking about if you are the people that are organizing and i, and I really appreciate um all the uh, student groups and in institutions that are you know implementing that and paying for things because architecture school wasn't like that either. Like I would do reviews for free all the time, but now there's like a, you know, an honorarium for like, even if it's like 75 bucks or something, uh, it's something. It's like, hey, here's a gesture of your, your knowledge and your time of being there. Um, and if that doesn't change, I feel like there is, um, there is, it's very difficult to um, do things differently. Like experimenting, like experimenting and thinking outside the box takes time, extra time. And through my research too, I realized like a few years ago when I was teaching a course on different experimenters throughout the architectural world, I was like, man, these are all old white men. And then my partner called me out on it. He's like, why is everyone in your course like old white men? I was like, I don't know, because they they are the only ones that are saying they're doing experimental architecture because they were privileged. They're like, oh yeah, we can do this on our own time with our own privilege. Um, and it's been a, my mission to sort of like expand that and also like recognize that, yeah, I call myself like, or the practice an experimental studio and which means in many ways we do things differently. In many ways we, you know, go through the fees like crazy. And I don't have the answer of like how to make that sustainable either because uh, there's a violence that comes with efficiency and production that's tied to the capitalist system. And as long as you're part of the system, you are extracting something. So how do we do it without extracting ourselves so much? And it's hard. I don't know. For me, it's just been about like throwing my eggs in all sorts of baskets that that come my way that I'm like, all right, that's a basket. I'll throw some in there and um, make some money that way too. But it is, it is difficult. And I think it is super important to question it at the core as well. Sorry, I went on a rant too. I feel like it's, it's, may it's I something. Just, may I just thinking. add one thing very quickly uh, is that this is actually fundamental and um, you know, it shouldn't be seen as uh, cause everyone is saying, you know, we don't have answers, but I think the reason why we don't have answers is because 
uh, you know, there hasn't been as much a critical time as there is today for us to begin having answers to this question. So, you know, in the past, we didn't have, you know, this serious, we, we did, but not as much uh, this serious problem of climate change, the serious problems that we have about um, related to inequality, things weren't, or, you know, they were, they were coming, you know, so I'm talking like, uh, you know, in the 20th century, early 20th century, architects were operating under a completely different paradigm. And now you guys are all going into that world. So it's not even a case of a matter of, uh, you know, um, it's, it's you, you're getting options. More and more, you're all going to be squeezed into a situation where you actually have to figure that out. And it's, it's up to you guys and your generation to really become more uh, creative and inventive and innovative about how you're going to deal with that. You know, how do you actually uh, sustain yourselves um, and even, you know, succeed and, and sometimes even thrive in your practices doing this kind of thing? So that's actually uh, a question for your generation um, and a serious question for your generation because at some point, the old way of practicing, which is why we're having this conversation, is going to no longer be feasible. So if it's no longer feasible, what are you actually going to do? So we are kind of maybe like the early guys who are starting this sort of thing. But in our context, there's still so much, um, you know, energy from the old paradigm that, you know, it's, it's still very difficult. <clears throat> But at some point, you know, it, it's, there's no longer going to be a, a, an option. So you do have to figure it out um, for, your, for yourselves. Yeah, I 1000% agree in this whole discussion about paid and exposure and also, I guess, students for interning. I, I think we often overwork and don't log uh, over time because we are insecure about it. And in both instances, we are contributing to this kind of system without knowing in that um, the next intern that comes along will be um, kind of expected to put in the amount of hour, the same amount of overtime or like hours, not knowing that you put in overtime. So you're just kind of really contributing to the system. And as much as you might think um, I'm okay with um, not getting paid, there's a lot of people that aren't and we, we should be really trying to address that. Um, and I think, Kristen, I saw that you had your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to say how much also I appreciate this conversation. Um, I'm part of a, a community uh, collabor creative collaborative that's a social enterprise in, um, a, in a chef community in Soweto, South Africa. And, and even working within the community it was sort of a response to to the extractive practices of academia in 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 these kinds of communities but also just how we insist on paying all the people who work for us in in the community itself and how important that is as well because um i mean i think otherwise just as you were saying melissa we become part of um we, we, of perpetuating this 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 way of working, um, you know, we sort of come in as experts and then, uh, so, or so I should say, so called experts, and um, and and bring with us these this, these hierarchies and 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 then expect people there to be to be so grateful that they don't need to be paid. And so, um, we've started this practice of everybody who works for us gets paid, and, and no matter what sort of uh, work they're doing. And, um, and I think that that also is really important. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Um, and we're having so many comments in the chat about this topic, and I'm so glad we've landed on it. Um, I know we're running out of time. And again, if anybody needs to leave, please do. We'll try to wrap it up soon. But I just want to touch on something Alana and Vivian are talking about in the chat, which is something that we've kind of in our last year of studies, and I'm sure a lot of people have been introduced to, but this idea of course credit compensation or work in integrated learning types of course delivery. Um, 
Are you guys aware of that? Or are you, do you have any thoughts about the balance between financial compensation for students versus course credit compensation or work integrated studio? Um, Cause I think this is like a new model that we're slowly seeing and there's a lot of controversy around it for sure. I don't have that much to say about it, but I think that I've always found it a little strange um, where students are, especially when it's the professor's like passion project mm -hmm. and then they have the students doing the work to get the project done. That's always felt really sus to me. That's all <laughs> I have to say. <laughs> yeah, I think this, this whole thing that you can get credits and you still do labor is really problematic. And frankly, you know, um, the more I'm hearing everyone speak, the more troubled I'm getting because we really Ooh. don't have answers. We, we, we are in a system that is about compensation for a particular kind of stuff. But I'm also reminded of um, Bartleby in Herman Melville's novel and what Bartleby would do, he would say is I, I, I choose not to. Now to choose not to is actually entitlement that not everyone can choose not to. But I do think that we can actually um, speak to the, uh, you know, actually speak out loud in conditions where we think we can. So speaking to college administrators, speaking out to the deans, I mean, without getting screwed, of course, I mean, you know, they have power. So uh, in a polite way, but constantly learning how to speak out, it seems to be something that all of you and I and everyone else need to learn in our contemporary world. How can we speak out and speak the truth without our, jeopardizing our career? How do we navigate that thing? because that's the question of ethics and our values. So I don't know what the answer is again, as I, but I do, when I talk about, when, when I hear everyone talk about compensation and labor, I also realize that we are often fearful to talk about that, recognizing that if we say things like, I want to be paid or my community partners need to be paid, they just, the, whoever is the funding authority might just say, okay, keep moving. Yeah, I would, Definite, like I agree with that. And um, to Maya's point too, like I, I think, like I've had experience with bringing on students from a, a university in Toronto that they started this program. And I actually raised it with them a, a couple of times. I'm like, this is kind of strange because they're required to work 80 to 120 hours they get credit for it. So the way I've done it is that I bring, like whenever I have capacity, I bring on and I say, okay, what do you want to work on? Like, this is like, you're not going to work on things I'm doing, but like, I can be your advisor. Uh, so what can we do? So for example, the project that we did last year with Toronto U and with New Currency, which was a youth led organization was working with one of these students who played a key role in developing that project. And it's like become like, you know, he'll be part of 2.0. Like it's, he's really taken a charge of the project on its own because it was his research as well. So that was one way. But then when I raised it to the institution, they were like, yeah, we know it's kind of strange. And many students reach out saying that, yeah, they just become like free labor because most uh, uh, partners, like the corporate partners, are just like this is free labor yeah 80 hours okay can you do these renderings for us uh can you do drawings for us there is no mentorship even though they're supposed to provide some mentorship so i think there is ways to do it i think like there it, it's quite nuanced because you know when you're learning you're learning i'm still learning and a lot of the things that i'm learning i have to put in the time to learn them but then do I have, like when I worked at the corporate firm for three years before I lost my mind and left, uh, there was no mentorship. It was just like labor, labor, overtime, labor, condos, blah, 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 <laughs> you know, all this bullshit that I'm like, I don't want to do this. Uh, but then working at smaller firms, it was more mentorship. It was like, and I spend like 
70% of my time on mentorship to actually like, pass on some of this knowledge and uh, to help, like, you know, uh, think about how we can re rethink the practice. So are they valid? I think like I went to a school that was a co-op program. So um, one year out of the four years I worked, um, you know, it, it was our job to find the job to whatever it is. If it, if it paid or not, it was up to you. Like the first one I did for free, I, but I lived in Barcelona. So I negotiated with myself. I was like, okay, I'm not getting paid. I got a grant from the university, which paid 1500 bucks. I'm like, okay, that's 500 bucks a month. That will pay for rent for a room in Barcelona, but I'll get to live in the city that I love and I'll learn things. So I negotiated with myself. And I think there's a danger of denying yourself of knowledge and experiences if you just think about not wanting to do unpaid labor. So I think there is like different value systems that you have for yourself. And I think as students, it's really important to think of that. Like, I would never do unpaid labor for a corporate firm or any corporation for that fact. Uh, but if I'm working with a community and I know that I love this as, um, uh, as, uh, 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 as I'm sorry, I, I forgot your name. Um, as you were mentioning that you, you oh. yes, thank you. Sorry about that that you, you know, quoted a $500, which is like minimal. Um, and, but that's based on your value system. You're like, you know what, I want to do this and I will do it for this fee. So I think there is a, it's nuanced and it, it's not so black and white. It's not so like, you know, I'm not going to do that at all. Cause if you want to come out, graduate and make good money, you're most likely going to be doing really shitty, terrible projects for terrible people uh, at, terrible firms mostly there are some of us that are making it and there's very few options just to be real with you because that's what happened to me I came out graduated um, did a thesis that was super personal to me uh, graduated I'm like yeah I'm gonna apply to these small experimental research firms I love their work met with them and they were like the way I am now they're like we literally don't even have space for you to sit like let alone pay you <laughs> like i'm sorry but uh if you do it you gotta apply to some of the bigger firms and then i ended up at the corporate firm so and as long as i think that's planned and i always encourage students to be like think about an expiry date like you may do certain things that you don't want to do but because you have to you got to pay the bills but learn learn things you can learn things from corporate firms how do they do how do they run their practice? How do they manage their projects? How do they get all the projects? How do they do business development? How are they making sure there's coffee for everyone so you're comfortable so you don't question anything else about it? Like, how do they get you the things uh, to make sure you're comfortable? And then use that against it, against the system in whatever capacity. And that's what I've been trying to do. So I don't know, I, I think there is a way of like, thinking about experiences and really uh, being critical about the choices and not just saying no for the sake of um, because it is like free labor, because you may be actually losing, like you may be hurting yourself, but if you're working with someone and you're get, getting mentored and you're working on specific projects, um, I think it, it can be fruitful and you get a, you know, a course credit like what is like, I, I had friends that worked at, in Canada the whole time for the, for the co-op terms and they made money and they probably have paid off their student debt. I'm still paying for my student debt. Would I change that experience? No, I lived in Barcelona. I met new friends. So my, I expanded my network. I lived in, in Argentina. I worked there, you know, I got paid, um, was it enough to pay for my student no loan? No, but I gained some experience. So I don't know, there's, there's different value systems that you need to set for yourself. What is it about? And sometimes you just gotta do things that you don't wanna necessarily do because you have to, and you shouldn't um, frown upon that 
because we all do, we all contradict ourselves all the time. And so, sorry, another rant. <laughs> <laughs> really, really quickly. I think really what you're saying is like, be intentional about the choices you're making. Um, it is okay to work at a firm. Um, you might enjoy it, so you should try it. I think try as many different experiences as you can. Use the time outside of work to like volunteer. Again, that's free labor, but that's something that like just you're trying to dabble in things to figure out what it what it is that you actually want to do. And I feel like that's what I did when I was working full time. I was doing things on the side really intentionally so that I could learn more, so that I could figure out what I wanted to do. And then I I very slowly stepped down. Um, or stepped into this role of doing this more full-time. And so it was always trying to balance, like, how much money am I making? Um, what am I, where am I trying to go? What am I doing now that is working? What's not working? And then you can really intentionally figure out what your kind of journey is going to be through the field. Yeah, that's so, so great. I feel like we can have a whole panel just on this topic. And I'm loving it, but I do also see maybe one last comment. Um, Douglas has his hand up. So Douglas, I know it's been up for a while if you're still there and you have a question you'd like to ask. Yes, yes, I do. And I, but first I wanted to thank AADE for organizing this wonderful panel today. Um, it is a, a we, I, I'm the chair of architecture at Athabasca University and this global studio thing that uh, Kristen has been so wonderfully organizing with groups like the ADE has been a wonderful experience for us. And in fact, we are moving um, and trying to get further funding to keep the global studio going. And it's my hope that maybe we could engage all of the panelists as being part of that in the future. But I had two really quick points. Um, the, the And one is about regulation. Um, it, I learned recently that 90% of the buildings in Canada are actually not designed by architects. And at the same time, what we're seeing in the field of architecture and in education, increasing regulation and regulation and regulation, which almost ties us into knots, so much so that some people are expressing the, the idea that maybe we need to deregulate the entire profession. And I would suggest deregulating the way we educate architects as well so that we can do the kind of experimentation that people have been talking about. So I wanted to ask the panelists about that. But the second thing was, um, you know, we are very, 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 very poor business people. Almost everybody else in the construction business makes more money than architects, engineers, tradespeople, they all do quite well. But it also suggests to me that maybe the, the corporate model that we've discussed a little bit is part of the problem and not just in architecture but for the entire world as long as short-term profits trump long-term benefits we are going to be in a terrible position and the corporate model is designed to be extractive of your labor and so it seems as architects we need to design new models for the business of architecture uh, and here i was thinking about things like cooperatives and whether cooperatives might be a way of addressing some of the things that people have talked about today. So two quick points, but again, I wanted to thank everybody for a wonderful discussion. Thank you, Douglas. Yeah, great points. I don't know if anybody wants to speak on those quickly um, or have any thoughts. Um, I'll just jump in and say um, that Sachava has suggested in the chat that we have a, another panel on making sustainable practice sustainable. Um, and so I'd like to propose that we actually do that. And um, so if people would like to email me on, on thoughts on that, and let's put that on the calendar to do as, as the upcoming Global Studio um event because i think this is a really critical issue and i think um things like um what Ar arjit brought up the idea of sharing and i think that this is something um that that really needs to be developed further and and i've been really interested in looking at some of the ideas coming out of the the notion of of a sharing economy um because I, I, honestly i don't see how ideas like what we're talking about today can can be sustainable and move forward if we don't nurture some um, greater uh, sharing within society. 
Um, so I think, uh, yeah, I, I just want to thank all of you for, for bringing this conversation to the global studio and to, um, to, to out there. And, and just to remind everyone that it will be, the recording will be available on the website and it's open access to anyone who wants to listen to it. Yeah, that's great, Kristen. Um, yeah, I think it is 1040 now. This has been such a great conversation. I mean, we still have 41 participants, which is like in the kind of realm of like studio deadlines to see this many people still here just like speaks to the quality of this conversation. And I'm just so thankful. Um, I think just Joy has a few closing thoughts and we'll get everyone out of here. <laughs> I wasn't going to say much, just thank you to all four of our panelists for taking the time today and contributing and creating such a fruitful conversation. Um, it was honestly so inspiring and we were excited about this for like a long time. So it's great to have had it and it be even better than what we could have imagined, what we could have imagined. <laughs> Um, so yeah, there's still also some great discourse in the chat. So I think what we're going to do is also when you upload the recording, we aren't able to like see the chat. So we'll upload that to the Miro board as well. And super excited about maybe a part two that's been discussed. So yeah, thank you everyone for your time. This is awesome. <laughs> Thanks everybody. Thanks everybody. And thank, thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Kristen, and thanks to the AED. Of course, thank you for showing support as always. <laughs>